Hello, I'm Ramon Albashawi, I'm your Mini Week Coordinator and I'd like to present Rob Craig, our first speaker for this Sporting Community Empowerment course. Rob Craig previously worked for 16 years as an engineer. He returned to university in Aberdeen in 2008. In a complete departure from his former professional life, he is now a PhD student in Dot Rural, the university's rural digital economy research hub. I spoke to Rob about his work with local people in rural Aberdeen and how it relates to community empowerment. Well, I guess I uh, came to do this kind of research, participatory research, by a bit of a convoluted route. Um, I used to be an aeronautical engineer and I spent 16 years in the engineering profession. And I came back to university in 2008 in search of a, something different to do in life. And I think I found it, really. Um, I did a little bit of work during my master's degree looking at issues of accessibility between... Uh, the islands and the mainland of Scotland. And I think it was during that, that work and subsequently that I realised some of the things that I didn't like about the way I'd approached that research, about that, the arm's length attitude that I'd taken to doing the surveys. And I think the fact that when I did the survey and looked back on the survey again, when you actually visit the place, you realise some of the stupid questions that you're asking in surveys that are constructed at arm's length when you don't understand the place and the people and the history and the culture. And that was really one of the main starting points in terms of getting into participatory research for me. Um, I then had this opportunity to come and do a PhD and I resolved from the start, because of the nature of the subject matter, that I wasn't going to approach it in the way that I'd done my master's research. Um, and it's really just happenstance that, um, that brings me to the point of, of having done the work in the way that I've done it. it. It wasn't some grand plan. It was a combination of my personal values, my own experiences, um, the influences of people that have done work of a similar nature around me, uh, some things I'd read and been asked to read and told to read or suggested that I'd read, and all of this came together to have a real sort of powerful influence on the way I wanted to approach this research. So I think because of that, um, um, as I said, it kind of evolved, and, it, and it's still evolving. It's evolving all of the time. It's not just a, uh, you write down a plan and away you go, there you are, you're doing participatory research. It's a constant process of, of, of doing things and thinking about them, trying to do them better next time and, and looking at your behaviour uh, and the ways in which things have come out once you've been doing them in the field. I think one of the things about this work, and it's one of the points of reflection for me, is that the agenda has been set by me in this work, which sits uncomfortably with me. Um, but in some respects, um, I feel that you always have to have somebody with an agenda involved somewhere I had a strongly held belief that um, the way in which work about accessibility had been tackled in the past was great but hadn't gone far enough. So the work is conceived as a project about accessibility, in particular its relationship with social exclusion and how you might increase accessibility and help tackle social exclusion. And we do that from the perspective of the individual, an individual person living within a rural community. Uh, and the ultimate aim of that really is to be able to try to come up with some way in which we can understand what the picture is on the ground, what the picture of accessibility and the picture of social exclusion is on the ground in a way which might enable us to, or anyone, say a public sector organisation or a local charity, to make decisions about how they can use their resources, and in some cases very limited resources, to greater effect. But ultimately it's really about the pursuit of greater social justice. So distributing those resources so that they can benefit more people more appropriately. And within that subject matter, we're deploying participatory approaches, a kind of a community learning and development type participatory approach. So it's almost a community development project within the academic wrapper of accessibility and social exclusion. So I've kind of um, conceived of accessibility in terms of two questions. And it's questions such as, who can or can't you be and why? And what can and can't you do and why? So it's really about the achievability of outcomes, roles that you can take on in life, things that you can achieve in life. And what we're trying to do is trying to assess the achievability of outcomes by knowing about the opportunities that people have to do things and the capabilities they have to take advantage of those opportunities. So when it comes to participatory action research, the starting point for me is, um, is this particular picture where you've got two aspects of research. You've got direct action and you've got indirect research. Now, direct action for me means anything that anyone would do within their community, any charitable work, anything, whatever it may be. And then you've got indirect research, and that's the kind of research that all too often gets done at arm's length. But for me, you then bring these two things together, 
and their point of intersection. That's to me what summarises or signifies participatory action research. So um, I believe that you um, involved people at a local level, that they became the researchers. Before I kind of got into the depth of what participatory working means, I had an idea in my head to try to form a little local research team. So I recruited three ladies, one from each of three villages, um, and that was more by luck than judgement, um, because there wasn't an awful lot of people coming forward to take part. And one of the things I think about that is that I didn't start early enough in trying to recruit people to take part. So if I'd have started a bit sooner, then maybe there would have been more people um, uh, willing and able to be involved. Having said that, there's a downside to having more people come forwards, and that's you then have to engage in some kind of recruitment process, which means you've got to start making value judgments about people's worthiness of being involved in the project, and that doesn't sit easy with me either. And, and what were their reasons for doing it? I think um, all of them have genuine interest in trying to improve, in their words, local public transport. Um, so that's what they say in... in, in, in being able to contribute to. Um, and I think that's some, something to do with that they've been involved in that in the past. They've lived in the area a very long time. So they've got experience of the change of their, um, the level of accessibility in their village. I was very lucky in finding these three people as well. Um, and in some respects I think it's a, it could be a little bit false because it's not always that easy to find people that can work really well together. I've got a little homespun theory here that um, during our work there were three stages of becoming. Um, the first one of those is called becoming participant, then becoming researcher and becoming surveyor. Now I've said that these are revealed stages but you know it's a bit of a, a point for debate really is whether it's revealed or whether it's consciously planned um, or subconsciously planned rather. So becoming participant is where we, we, we got together as a group and we formed as a group um, and worked out how we were going to work together and what we were going to do. Then becoming researcher was characterised by some little uh, talks that I gave about various aspects of research, how to design surveys, what does it mean by information and data, what are the ethics of doing research and so on. And we also did some other things like we came to the university to do a, a day's training that the School of Education provided for us. And that was about giving and receiving feedback, which is a very central part of this kind of work, being able to do things and then reflect on them. And then the final bit was what we've called becoming surveyor. And that was the, the process of working up a survey instrument, which in our case happened to be a questionnaire, working that survey instrument up, learning how to actually administer that in terms of um, interview skills training and so on and so forth, and then actually going out and doing it. So we became surveyor by the process of practising our interview skills and so on. And I think one of the really important things about becoming surveyor from a participatory research point of view is that I was quite clear that I was not going to become the researcher that wouldn't allow my surveyors to go out and do the interviews on their own if they wanted to do them on their own. Now I may have more freedom to, 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 to act as I wish, there may be less riding on it for me, uh, which enables me to allow these people the freedom to do the interviews. But it's still something that I fervently believe is a key part of, of building uh, a trusting relationship with people that you're working with in the community. Not preventing them from doing anything that they choose to be involved in and giving them all the opportunities and all the help to become involved in those things. So what does community empowerment mean to you? I guess there's two aspects to that. There's, there's what does it mean in sort of practical terms and what does it mean in personal or sort of more emotive terms. If I think about the practical terms to begin with, I think it's, um, it's an outcome, not an action. I think it's about helping people to, or working with people to help them remove the barriers to them taking part, a full part in life as it were, for them being able to do things to improve their, their life situation. It's about helping to overcome those barriers that we all face in life um, and helping people to understand that there is the possibility of an alternative, a much better uh, situation than they may currently find themselves in. So I think there, um, that's what it means to me really in practical terms is helping to tackle barriers. I think in emotional terms or emotive terms, community empowerment really is a way of, in some respects, and this sounds very selfish, but as I've got older and older I've become a bit frustrated by the fact that 
I feel like my life's under control by someone else at times. And I wanted to do something to see whether we could reverse that trend, as it were. The, you know, instead of waiting for things to, to, to happen to us or be done to us, to see whether we could actually get out there and take control for ourselves. And I think for, for an emotive point of view, that's, that's, that's my motivation here, is really about trying to see whether um, I can reverse the trend of feeling like I'm under control or being controlled by something else. So how did you empower the community? I go back to my earlier point that I think community empowerment is an outcome as opposed to an action. I can't sit here and say to you, oh, I'm going out to empower the community. All I can say really is that I'm going out to try to look at the, the, the things that, as I said to you before, that are barriers to people improving their, 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 their lives, as it were. So look, look for those areas of difficulty, look for the things that you need to try to overcome those areas of difficulty and try to bring my sort of skills, my knowledge, my background to bear in some way that it has some beneficial effect. So that's kind of the, the high level view of community empowerment. I think you can look at low level stuff and you can think about in terms of individual people. When I spoke about the stages of becoming, um, my group had never done any kind of research or academic research before. Um, so in terms of empowerment, if you want to think about are they empowered, more empowered as researchers, then I hope to think that they are because they've had time to think and discuss and to listen to what I have to say about the process of doing research. They've experienced the challenges of doing it themselves. They've experienced the fact that things aren't straightforward and simple and you know, it takes time to actually do things. Um, and I think they understand the world of the researcher much better as a consequence. So I think empowerment, empowerment for, for lots of people that are involved in different ways, depending on their perspective, depending on their experiences, their skills, depending on what their objectives are in terms of taking part. I think um, there are all sorts of ways you could look at the issue of empowerment. But I come back to my, my initial point that can I answer the question, did I empower the community? I think that's a question that ultimately has to be put to the people in that community. What worked well in the project? I think it's quite difficult because I think an integral part of doing participatory work is this whole business of doing something and then thinking about it afterwards. And whether it's part of my character, I tend to think of the things that went wrong as opposed to the things that went well. And that's wrong of me because you need to be thinking of both. But um, let's think, let's, if, if I try to think about the things that I think worked well, um, I think that we did, as a group, we, we came together quite well as a group. We uh, formed a good working relationship, one that wasn't stressful, one that wasn't um, antagonistic, one in which we were able to speak reasonably open with each other, but I think there's always more work to be done there, um, and one that was productive and supportive. So I think that worked out. I think well, the second thing is that um, I had an idea in my head before I started this that I wanted the work to be fun. So we tried to be, um, have some variation in what we did day, uh, week to week, session to session. We would get out of the, the room that we would normally meet in. We would meet in other people's houses, in their kitchens, in their lounges. We would go to the community cafes and hold our discussions. We would do whatever we could to change the scenery, change the environment and not get stuck in a rut of boredom and re repetition as it were. So I think that worked okay. I think it needed a bit more planning though because I think one of the things about changing your, your, your location is you find that some of the things that you plan to do at the time are perhaps not so easy to do in a noisy community cafe for example. Um, and planning is a, a word that I try to steer away from because I don't think I see participatory work as kind of you know evolving over time as opposed to having a rigid plan. But I do think you need to have some some things in your back pocket to pull out for the the most appropriate setting. What would you have done differently if you were starting again? I think there's all sorts of things that I would do differently, but I think one of the things to be careful of is to becoming is becoming too prescriptive. It's really good, it's really worthwhile, and as I've said to you before, doing things and thinking about them is an important part of the, of the work. You know, this sort of process of continuously thinking about what you're up to before you actually do it and then thinking about what you did once you've done it is a really important part of participatory work. One of the things, though, is that you can think too much about it and you can start to become very prescriptive about the way you could go about doing this kinds of work. And that might be absolutely fine for this particular situation, but when you try to transfer that to another situation, it might be completely wrong. So I would, I would try to steer away from being prescriptive. So there are, there are sort of six areas that I think um, I could have done better on or I think that we needed to think more clearly and, and, and be more proactive about. The whole thing about agenda setting was an issue for me and 
if I, if I go back to some of the sort of underlying ethics of this kind of work, I think openness and honesty is really important. And alongside those two things is courage. You know, you've got to have the courage of your convictions. You've also got to have the courage to realise that people might say no. And I think when it comes to agenda setting, it may have been much better for me to try to set out the agenda uh, in clear but full detail, as it were, and run the risk of people saying, no, I don't want to be involved. I think I was too reticent in terms of, uh, from a fear of uh, frightening people off, overwhelming them, thinking it's going to be much harder and much more uninteresting than, than they might have otherwise anticipated. So agenda setting is, is one that I think needs to be wrestled with. It's a really difficult thing to take this abstract subject matter and try to make up a case that people can understand and can buy into. And you can't do that in a couple of hours of meeting once a fortnight. You know, so I think the thought about how to convey what's quite difficult, quite abstract topics to people that don't have very much background in that, in that, in that subject matter needs a lot more thought about. I think the other thing was um, I had a big wrangle in my head going on about my positionality in the group, i.e. my position relative to others. You know, people talk about the issues of power in these kinds of relationships. Um, and I think I've come to the conclusion, though, the conclusion that it is a difficult thing to wrestle with, but I think it's too, too easy to become very reticent about imposing yourself or, or, or misusing power in the group. It's easy to become too reticent and therefore not be not be active enough, not be proactive enough. And, 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 and inadvertently, you're, you're exercising power because you're controlling the situation. By not being open and honest, saying, I've got a problem with power here because I'm worried about my position, you're inadvertently imposing power on other people. You're controlling their thoughts almost. So I think it's really important to, to, to understand your position in the group and to, to, to discuss that amongst you as a group and to get that settled, as it were. And there's a guy called John Allen, He's an academic. Uh, he writes about, he's written a book called The Lost Geographies of Power. And there's quite an interesting thing in there that he talks about power among as opposed to power over. And power among, I guess I would equate to what you might consider to be good leadership or good management. People that you're prepared to work for because you respect them, because they treat you fairly. So it's trying to bring out those qualities in your relationship with your group, exercising power in that way, as opposed to issuing orders and expecting people to obey those commands. So I think that's an important issue to tackle. I think managing time is a real big issue because as I said, you know, I envisage it only taking a few months and here we are, 18 months working. Late. And there's a colleague of mine, Karen McArdle, at the University of Aberdeen, who talks about cycles of learning, um, where she says, start off small and slowly build, build up the, the work that you're doing, step by step, repeat some aspects of it and then add to it and build it up. And I, I buy into this idea because... Some of our work was compartmentalised, and it meant we squeezed some of the more difficult stuff down into a very short time scale. And that's difficult for anyone to work under, with all the pressures of um, the promises you're making to your survey participants. You know, constantly losing your deadlines is a very de demoralising, demotivating experience. So it's important to start pretty much everything early on, but start small, and to build it up slowly over time and repeat it. So, for example, I would have started, or I would have said to the group, do you think we should start the design of our survey now and think small, think about a small survey and then slowly increase the design as we went along and added to that things about ethics and question type and sorts of data. So I'd have tried to blend it all into one really and build it up much more slowly. I think there's an underlying value base that I, I, I kind of hold true and some of these things I've spoken about indirectly during the course of this discussion but I think the underlying value base is something that you really have to buy into if you want to do participatory work well. And by doing it well, I mean doing it truly ethically. And that's a difficult one to, it's a difficult debate to have in your head because um, depending on the sorts of person, you're very critical of yourself. The debate can be endless and can be self-defeating. Self um, so you do need to take external opinions on the positions, you, the ethical issues you face, the challenges that you're facing to get a reality check about whether it really is a challenge. And you've also got to take the opinions of the other people that you're working with. You've got to be open, you've got to be honest. You've got to give them the opportunity to be able to speak openly and honestly about you as an individual and how you're conducting yourself. And I think the final thing really in terms of things that we did less well is, is coping with the sort of social and institutional pressures. Always when doing participatory work, I found that there are always pressures upon you that are out with your control. If you're not doing, like me, a PhD, there are requirements that the institution has uh, for you to have done certain things by certain timescales. 
um, they're providing you money to do this work. There's a psychological pressure that comes out of the fact that they're paying for you to do this work. There are other social pressures like managing people's expectations. Now, we did that well, but nevertheless, there were still difficulties involved in doing that. Um, and I think the other sorts of social pressures come from the fact that uh, this is a learning process. Doing participatory work is a learning process. You start from small beginnings and you build on those small beginnings. And it's very easy for people to be critical of you um, because you don't say or do the right things or you don't behave in certain ways that they might associate with participatory type activities. And I think that is a really difficult thing to try to manage is to try to look beyond that and, and just carry on ploughing your own furrow, but taking advice, learning from your mistakes, acting and then reflecting on that action.